Hello, I'm Fred Moulton, uh, Libertarian Futures Society. Um, several LFS members are here, and uh, our, one of our previous Prometheus Award winner, Werner Vinci, uh, expresses his regrets because the, pan, uh, the programming uh, putting him on another panel at the same time slot. He also wanted to be here. Uh, it's uh, coffee clutch. Yes, right uh, yeah, it's uh, an unfortunate uh, scheduling. Uh, the uh, Prometheus uh, Award, uh, sponsored by the Libertarian Future Society, was established in uh, 1979, uh, making it one of the uh, most enduring <coughs> awards after the Ebula and the Hugo, and one of the uh, oldest fan-based uh, awards uh, currently uh, presented in science fiction. Uh, the Prometheus Award uh, honors the novel which best explores the possibilities of free future, uh, champions individual rights, uh, including personal and Liberty and uh, Dram uh, is dramatic in its uh, examination of the, uh, the conflict uh, between individuals and force and governments, and uh, also creates uh, critiques the uh, tragic consequences of the use of power. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Prometheus Award finalists, which were published in 2001, uh, there were five finalists. They were Falling Stars. Uh, by uh, Michael Flynn, uh, Psychohistorical Crisis by Donald Kingsbury, Enemy Glory by Karen Michelson, The American Zone by L. Neal Smith, and Hosts by F. Paul Wilson. And the winner is Psychohistorical Crisis by Donald Kingsbury. That's very nice. First gold I've ever had. My, my father used to, my father used to be a mining engineer. He figured out his dreams, but uh, now, now you have your own plaque. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, oh yes. Yeah. It was uh, a sort of a thing that I've been thinking about writing for for a long, long time. Uh, I, I started reading uh, Asimov's Psychohistorical Crisis, his, his foundation stories when I was about 16. And what, what intrigued me uh, about the stories was not only that you had, you had these constraints of certain historical <coughs> factors and you, that you had to live with. And we all know we have to live with constraints. We can't, uh, we can't walk on the sun. There's lots of things we, we can't do. But you have freedom within those, those constraints. And that sort of came out in the series. It wasn't a, kind of a deterministic thing where the whole future was determined and everybody was just sort of a puppet carrying out their, their little, little part. It was more like as Asimov said, it was more like uh, uh, hydrodynamics, where you don't follow the individual atoms through the system. They can go anywhere they want, but they have certain constraints that they've got to and they've got to handle. Now, one of the one of the things that bothered me as a teenager and bothered me. Uh, all the time, and it became the seeds of the, of the novel Psychohistorical Crisis. In fact, that is the Psychohistorical Crisis, was the idea, which was very simplistic, that <clears throat> in order to predict, if you could predict the future, then you had to keep it secret. Because if you didn't keep it secret, then somebody would just go out and, and falsify your your prediction. But what that does is uh, it sets up an elite sets up an elite government. The people who and then and this was came through in, in Asimov's stories. You have the second foundation, which is doing the predicting. 
and they're not telling anybody about what the prediction is or what the future is or anything like that. They're keeping it a secret. But at the same time, predicting the future is, there's no single future that you predict. You, you, you look at, it's, it's just, just like ourselves. We, we walk out into the street and we predict that a bus is coming along and we decide whether we're gonna run across the street we're, we're going to walk slowly and get run over, or we're going to wait for the bus to go by. You know, we have all these decisions to make when we, we predict. I, I predict that if I run, I can get across the street ahead of the bus. I predict that if I don't run, I'll get run over by the bus. And I predict that if I stand still, uh, I'll survive. So I have these choices that prediction gives you. Well, the Second Foundation had choices too. They, they, uh, Harry Seldon, you know, he, he looked at the decline of the galaxy and predicted that if you set up certain people in a certain place under a certain environment, they would be able to revive a civilization within a shorter period of time than <coughs> if that wasn't done. But still, you have this, this second foundation making these decisions. And what happens with an elite is that they start to make decisions toward their own benefit. Okay, we have a hard time predicting, so this option, which is kind of fuzzy and is difficult to examine, well, we'll make sure that that one doesn't happen because it, it doesn't fit the math too well. And we'll take this one, which may be the easy core. Things, decisions like that happen. And nobody, nobody can contest this because nobody knows what's going on. So you have this powerful government which is kind of treating that the, the, the people as atoms rather than as, as, as thinking people. So it occurred to me that this would cause some terrible crisis in the future when people would begin to decide things that the, the, the second foundation didn't want. It, it occurred to me that people would be very upset that they weren't allowed to study the machinery of prediction. <coughs> that they were, it would develop a feeling of exclusion, a feeling of being manipulated, even though the manipulators are claiming to be doing it all for your own good. You know, this is similar to the, 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 the Catholic position when they didn't allow anybody to read the Bible because only the well-trained priests and clergy would be able, capable of understanding it. So you weren't even allowed to, to read it. Uh, so I figured that there would be groups that would be trying to reduplicate psychohistory. And there would be people who would feel disfranchised. And so I wanted to deal with that kind of thing where you, where you do have the, no matter what the constraints are, you have choices, your own free choices to, to, to make and the individual does make does make a difference. He, if he handles these constraints and works within them, he can do a lot of do a lot of things. So I have my uh, central character, Iranosa, who just sort of finds out sort of these things while he's studying psychohistory and he develops his own way of proceeding and 
notices that there's this crisis coming up, which I'm a mathematician, so I know how you can obscure things when you want an answer that the mathematics isn't really <laughs> isn't really giving you. You can. Uh, Like you like you like smooth functions which don't have which don't have these discontinuities and stuff. So you ignore the discontinuities and you only just study smooth functions, and you apply your smooth functions to the model, and you get all these nice smooth answers which may have nothing to do with with reality because reality may not be very happy with the smooth function. So you you can get I mean, like something like mathematics, it's only a model of what what's really there. You, there's no way that you can have uh, a perfect picture of the future, and you have to be very careful about your assumptions and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a great deal of fun to to do, and I especially wanted to to. to look at Asimov's assumption that you had to be secret if you were going to predict the future. I don't think you, you, you have to be. I think you get a very interesting future if, if we have this predictive knowledge. Well, in, in our society, we do, have, we do have a lot of powerful predictive tools. They're not as powerful as in, in the science fiction and all that. But we do have powerful predictive tools, and it's better if you can go to the university and you can study them, or you can buy a book and you can study them at home, and you can model things, and, and people have access to it. They may not want to do it, but I know a lot of people who are in the stock market now are very interested <laughs> in doing that kind of thing. So you get a very different uh, society when you predict something that you'd like, and then you find out that everybody else is predicting something else, and they're stopping you because they don't like what you want to, you want to develop all this land, you know, and you want to cut it down and uh, uh, sell it or something, and they, they want to live there or something. So you have one goal and they have another, and you're predicting that you have the power to go in there and cut it down, and they're predicting that you don't, and you get this big, uh, big conflict going. Um, if everybody has enough power to really predict, they predict that uh, there's some compromise there that they can do and you get a mutually acceptable future. So if more and more people can predict something, you, you get these back and forth feedback exchanges in which people zero in on a future which they all can accept, rather than say something like a second foundation where they can predict the future. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not because you don't know what's going to happen. You are not in a position to oppose it. Or if you are in a position to oppose it, you don't really have the power to do it because you don't really know where it's going, so you're putting your efforts in the wrong place to oppose it. Anyway, I thought that was a lot of very interesting discussion that could be done that wasn't being, that Asimov didn't do in his later, his later say, it, it, it bothered me that he had a robot that had been around for 20,000 years manipulating human history. And we were all just sitting there and uh, he was taking care of us because he had these laws of robotics in him that he had to take care of everybody, you know. And, you know it's nice to have a mother and father when you're four years old. It keeps you out of a lot of trouble. But by the time you get to be 50, uh, <laughs> you don't really want. I mean, you want to be friends with your mother and father, and you want them to give you advice and all that. But you don't want them to be running your life. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for the award. Thank you. Our next award is the Hall of Fame Award, which focuses on older classic fiction, 
including novels, novellas, short stories, poems, plays, and with uh, expanded number of movies and television. <coughs> the finalists for this uh, year's award were A Clockwork Orange, a novel by Anthony Burgess, Requiem, a short story by Robert A. Heinlein, It Can't Happen Here, a novel by Sinclair Lewis, The Prisoner, a television series by Patrick McEwen, The Lord of the Rings, a trilogy of novels by J.R.R. Tolkien. The winner is The Prisoner, a television series by Patrick McEwen. <laughs> Mr. McEwen uh, could not be present, but uh, has sent a statement which will be read by Fran Van Cleve, a science fiction author and LFS member. Okay, McGowan's acceptance speech. Mr. McGowan wanted um, me to, um, uh, I guess, read these comments to you. So uh, he said that uh, it meant uh, quite a bit to him because he is philosophically in the same ballpark with individualists and libertarians. And um, uh, he also said, uh, I am very touched. There's no point in talking about the show. Everything that's in it, in there, is in there. I would say that I am amazed, after nearly 40 years since the prisoner first got out, to receive this prestigious award. I'm glad you expanded the spectrum of your award from novels and novellas to include film and television, because every now and then in film and television, something good will come out. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I'm sure the various organizations uh, would like to uh, have people sit around and uh, discuss uh, the winners who are here or, or their acceptors. And uh, there's some literature from on the back table to the various organizations. Thanks a lot.